I'll just charge $8,000 for a two page website. And the client was super happy. Only two pages. And you are probably thinking, how is that even possible with uh, templates and AI everywhere? That's exactly what I'm about to show you. Every step, every decision, why clients pay premium prices and how you can charge them too. If you don't know me, I've been designing since around 2004. I was a kid when I started and I'm not just teaching. I'm actually working on real projects and making money as a freelancer. And stay until the end because somewhere in the video will show you one thing that if you offer and deliver that, you can make a lot more money. You don't want to miss that. Here is why clients still pay premium in the era of AI. AI can generate designs quickly, but at this moment in time, it cannot replace the human thinking behind a good design. A premium website is not the output, it's the outcome. It's the strategy, structure, communication, and decisions that solve a real business problem. AI can help, right? That's why you should learn how to use it. But it cannot run discovery calls, uh, understand positioning, challenge assumptions, or guide a client through complex choices. Premium clients are not just buying pixels, right? They are buying clarity, judgment, and accountability. You must bring context, intuition, taste, and live experiences. That's why businesses still, to this day, invest in skilled designers. Now, here's my process. So the first step is the discovery call. So what is a discovery call? A discovery call is the first conversation you have with a potential client where you both figure out if working together makes sense, okay? It's simply a short call where you learn about their business, their goals, their problems, and what they need. So you can basically decide if you can help and what the project should look like. And during the discovery call, these are the things that you should pay attention to. The first thing is the business, who they sell, who they serve, and what makes them different, okay? And ideally, you should do a little bit of research before the discovery call, and then you ask the right questions. And then their goals, what they want the website to achieve and what success looks like. And then the audience, who they are targeting and what the audience cares about. Then the problem, what is not working right now and what is blocking growth. The scope, pages, features, integrations, and any technical requirements. The brand direction, existing assets, style preferences, inspiration, and any other references. The timeline, deadlines, dependencies, and internal constraints the budget, the range, their expectations, and whether they can proceed. And then the decision process, who approves, who gets feedback, and how communication will work. The discovery call is very important because often it's the first face-to-face -face communication and leaving a good impression is key. The second step is creating the mood board. After the discovery call, I like to create a quick brief that summarizes the goals, the scope, and direction. And then I move into the mood board phase. So what is a mood board exactly? A mood board is a board of visual inspiration that helps you define the look and feel of a project before and during the design process. And here is an example of a mood board. Here is a quick note. The real $8,000 project that I delivered two weeks ago is under NDA, so basically non-disclosure agreement but I will walk you through my exact process using a different project. This one is bigger and is the one that I usually show to agencies to get high ticket projects, okay? The workflow and thinking are basically the same. The only difference is that the website that I will show you is worth way more than $8,000. To me, starting the design process with uh, a mood board is crucial, okay? Because it basically helps me get the vibe of the project right. During the next call, I like to do a detailed mood board walkthrough. So basically, I show all the images, I explain them, I also, you know, break down the ideas and the inspiration behind those images. You know, here's also where we select the different color palettes. And uh, this is uh, crucial, even though a lot of people skip this step, because when you show the mood board and you can explain the ideas behind all the pictures, basically, you are showing to the client that you have sharp design thinking skills and they will appreciate that very much, okay? I'm going to do a quick walkthrough so you can see exactly how I do it. All right, so here we have an image of a white Porsche, and I'm not using this image right here as a reference for visual style, okay? It's more about the craftsmanship, the excellence, and attention to detail that Porsche is known for, what I'm inspired by, okay? And I want to basically reflect that in the design. Here we have an image of the Mona Lisa, and it's the same idea. It's not a reference for visual style, okay? It's more about getting inspired by the excellence of the Renaissance uh, design uh, overall, okay? And the innovation of people like Leonardo da Vinci and the masterful attention to detail of artists like Raphael. So basically, this image is not about the colors or the look, okay? It's more about the craftsmanship behind it. And it reminds me to keep the same level of attention to detail when preparing for a developer handoff, for example. 
this image right here is indeed for visual uh, inspiration because I'm going to use a color that is similar to this tone of blue. Okay? This one inspires me to incorporate illustration and playfulness into the project. Disney's world building is unmatched, right? So I will pull from that energy. This one is more direct and I just like this color orange and I will use it on some small details. Same thing with uh, this uh, color blue, okay? And also the different blue tones inside of this glacier. I can basically extract some nice colors from here. This image also isn't about visual uh, style, okay? It's about uh, structure, simplicity, and functional elegance. Dito Rams always reminds me to design with intention and clarity. And that's why I've added this image here in the mood board. This image right here is just like this one, okay? I like this color orange, and I will use it on some small details throughout the project. And that's how you present a mood board. The third step is creating the persona profiles. And what is a persona profile? A persona profile is a description of your ideal user so you know who you are designing for and how to serve them better. So here we have the persona profiles and the first thing we see is basically the country, okay? This business is targeting the United States. And then we have two demographics. We have the existing demographic and then the new target demographic. And basically this project is for an e-commerce business, okay? So these are the existing customers, right? And then these are the target customers, so the new targets basically, okay? And as we can see here, when we see the age, we can see that this uh, demographic is, uh, you know, older, older people. And then this one is younger people. So this business has been targeting older people and now it's time to target, you know, a younger demographic. And here's the person's information. We have the name, occupation, age, income level, gender, education level, location, marital status. And then we have here, um, you know, the background and life stages. We have the shopping behavior. We have the preferred communication. We have the relationship with her cat. And, you know, this business basically focuses on selling products for cats. That's what we add here, okay? We have the goals and needs. We have the pain points and challenges. We have the influences and media consumption. And then we have the content preferences. And here we have some quotes that the person would say, okay? To basically better understand, like, how they communicate and stuff like that. So why it's important to separate the persona profiles by demographic like I did here. When you are designing for different um, age groups, it's important to separate them because they have different needs and preferences. So you have to basically research and figure out what their uh, needs and preferences are by demographic, okay? Because as I said before, somebody that is 80 years old will have different needs and preferences than somebody that is uh, 20 years old. And you have to make sure that you keep that in mind while designing. Before we continue with the video, I wanna tell you something. If you feel stuck and you are not where you want to be with your freelance web design career, you can book a free strategy session with me to see if my group mentorship program is a good fit. I will help you gain clarity and show you the next steps to grow. If you are interested, all you have to do is click the link in the description and book a call with me. Now let's continue with the video. Step number four is to start designing the style guide or design system. And I will define both so you can see what the differences are. A style guide is the foundation of the project's visual language. It defines the core elements like typography, colors, basic components, so you have a consistent direction before designing the full pages. A design system and a style guide are very similar. They overlap. But a design system is more advanced and usually comes later, especially for larger or complex projects where you need a full library of components to build pages faster. So here we have the style guide and for smaller projects, a full design system is not necessary. Okay, So a simple style guide like this one is enough to keep visuals uh, consistent and aligned. When the project is large, when many pages share, uh, you know, like repeated components or when multiple designers or developers are involved, that's when building, uh, you know, like a full design system becomes worth the investment. For this project, I chose to create only the style guide for now because the system can always be expanded later once the visual direction is fully defined. All right, so I'm going to do a quick walkthrough. So here we have the logo, okay, in different colors and different backgrounds. Here we have the logo clear space, uh, you know, to give a space to breathe, you know, for the logo to breathe basically and not have other elements too close to the logo. And then here we have the logo don'ts, you know, when you design a logo or you have somebody design a logo, you have to make sure that, uh, you know, it's well represented, okay, throughout the entire design, all right? That's why we uh, basically add the logo don'ts. And then here we have the main backgrounds and then the neutral colors, okay? 
In terms of the neutral colors, you will notice that these colors are not traditional neutrals like pure black or gray, okay? In this project, the brand does not use pure black, so our neutrals come from within the brand's own palette. Here we have the secondary backgrounds, here we have the supplemental colors, here we have the color contrast, very important to make sure that there is enough contrast between the backgrounds and the text. Here we have the um, typography, here we have the brand in use, here we have the illustration style, illustration style again, and then again here, okay? The fifth step in my process is to create the wireframes. So wireframes are simple page layouts that define the structure, hierarchy, and flow of a website before any visual design, colors, or typography are added. All right, so here are the wireframes for this project. And as you can see, I've added text, right? But you don't have to if you don't want to, right? Or if you don't need to. Because wireframes, you know, there is no hard rule in terms of how to design wireframe. It's just like a guide and it doesn't have to be polished or anything. Just like, you know, a way for you to see the, uh, the layout and visual flow and also to communicate it with the, with the client. Um, you know, because wireframes are easier to change and easier to update than the you know like the final design so you want to so you want to have a step before that in order to make changes quickly so the main purpose of the wireframes is basically to confirm the structure before starting with the final design the next step is the hi-fi design and hi-fi means basically high fidelity which is the final design so here is basically how it looks like i like to have everything tidy and organized we have all the pages okay you know, still we have to make some changes, but you know, here's the blog. Um, here we have the, the boring pages, okay. The e-commerce part of the website. It's basically the final design. If you want to work with creative agencies, they love to see this, okay? They love to see, you know, like the process, they like to see how you structure things, everything. So make sure that you have at least one project that is very clean and basically that you can use to uh, do walkthroughs and show your entire process. I also like to show how the website adapts to different screen sizes. So I use this plugin called Breakpoints, okay? And it helps me show this very nicely. The plugin, as I said, it is called Breakpoints. This part is not finished yet, but I just wanted to show you how it looks like. Step number seven, funnel design. And this is the key to make way more money as a designer. And I will show you why. So what is a funnel? In web design, a funnel is a strategic sequence of pages designed to move a user toward a clear goal, okay? It usually includes a landing page, a value page, a form or checkout, and a confirmation page. Each step is intentional and optimized to guide the visitor, reduce confusion, answer objections, and increase the chances that they take the desired action. Here are the reasons why designing funnels can make you way more money. Funnels connect directly to revenue. Clients can track results and ROI. Clients are willing to invest more because it grows their business. Funnels usually require strategy, copywriting, automation, and psychology. And stuff like copywriting, for example, you can outsource that or even like sometimes clients have their own copywriters, okay? So it doesn't mean that you have to be like an excellent copywriter. It helps, but you can also outsource that. Funnels turn you from a designer into a growth partner and a strategist, okay? Businesses always need funnels as long as they want to grow. Funnels allow for monthly retainers due to ongoing optimization, and also businesses always have new offers, uh, new programs, or new products, okay? So this is a good way to be able to basically get paid through retainers every month. Funnels are easier to sell for five to 25K or more because the value is easy to justify. And I'm not saying that you have to over explain or try to justify your prices or whatever. I'm saying that, uh, you know, funnels are easier for clients to understand the value because it connects directly to revenues assets here. And I'm not saying that you have to over explain or try to justify your prices, okay? I'm saying that, uh, you know, like since funnels connect directly to revenues asset here, clients can see their return on investment in a much clearer way. And you can stack services like email flows, CRO, which means conversion rate optimization and automation. All right, so here we have the landing page and the landing page is part of the funnel in this project. And as you can see, the landing page is very simple, all right, because the main focus and the main mission is uh, to get conversions. So basically potential customers come from Google ads or Facebook ads, and then they land on this page. 
And the first thing they will see is basically the headline, and the headline should focus on a specific pain point for this avatar or persona profile. And then after that, they will see this video showcasing the product, they will see some proof from the media, and then here they will see more copy, again, focusing on a very specific pain point. And on a conversion-focused landing page, you should be very generous in terms of the copy, okay? As you can see, there is a lot of information here, the structure of the product, all right? And everything is clear and simple, okay? We have more proof here. The structure of this landing page is responsible for over $2 million in sales, so it's very, very effective. Another important part in a funnel are the emails, okay? And here for this project, I've designed these very simple emails, okay? Like these templates. And this can be reused for multiple emails, for blog posts, uh, for, you know, product launches and everything. Very simple, very straightforward and to the point. Step number eight, ADA checklist. An ADA checklist in web design is a simple list of rules you follow to make sure that a website is easy to use for people with different disabilities, like vision, hearing, or movement difficulties. And ADA stands for Americans with Disabilities Act. So here's the ADA checklist for this project. And as you can see here, I have some notes for um, you know, the developers, right? Explaining what it is and how to use it as well, okay? With an example. And as you can see, the ADA checklist contains you know, like navigation accessibility, headlines and titles, language, uh, media and color accessibility, design and aesthetics, you know, and so on, okay? And then whenever this is already, um, you know, apply and, and ready, and we know that basically passes the, um, the test, we add this icon right here, and we make sure that the website is uh, compliant. It's important to use an ADA checklist every time you design a website to make sure that everything is accessible and easy to use for people with disabilities, and especially when you are designing for American clients. Step number nine, developer handoff. Developer handoff is the stage where the designer gives the final design files, assets, and instructions to the developer so they can build the website exactly as intended. Clear and constant communication during handoff avoids mistakes, saves time, and keeps the project on track. So if you want me to make a video walking you through my entire uh, developer handoff process, let me know in the comments and I will try to make it happen. All right, so I hope this breakdown gave you real clarity on how a high ticket web design project looks like from start to finish. And if you want me to cover any step in more detail, just drop a comment and I will try to make a dedicated video. Thanks for watching. I will see you in the next one.